send me stuff. Let me know. I mean, cool. All right. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy to help out in any way I can. Yeah. Sounds like you got it down. <laughs> Doctor. Uh, okay. I think we will be live in a moment. The stream has apparently started. Uh, and so, of course, for the benefit of the people who are listening to this as a podcast, uh, this is a this is open space for September 23rd, my live interview with uh, Dr. Professor, Professor Doctor uh, David <laughs> Kipping from Columbia's Cool Worlds yeah. Lab. David, welcome to uh, Open Space. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be on your show tonight. So um, I've been watching your videos uh, for a while and your channel is one of those key astro channels that everybody who's interested in astronomy has to follow. So thank you so much for having me on. Well, th that's, that, that is huge coming from you, <laughs> uh, you know, cause I'm always just waiting for the astronomy, the actual astronomers to find out the uh you know that what i'm doing here as a really is just a fraud and so the fact that if i can continue <laughs> no, no. to carry this on um week after week that's that's amazing so why don't you let people know who you are and what you do sure so i'm a, an assistant professor here at columbia university i teach exoplanets i research exoplanets and uh my team is called the cool worlds lab the reason why we're, we're named that, I think when, when I first started telling people it's called the Cool World, we're going to do Cool World Lab, I think they were like, oh, you mean like dope planets or something like that. And that's that's, that's not so cool, the, man. Yeah, I guess it has that going for it kind of, but it's really that we're interested in planets which are at wide separations from their stars. So why would you be interested in those? Well, those are the planets that are kind of hospitable for life, potentially. And even beyond that, you know, going to sort of the orbits of Mars and Jupiter to those cold planets, those are largely unexplored uh, to a lot of us exoplanet astronomers. And thus we want to start learning about these planets going forward. And I thought that would be a great theme for the group to focus on. So that's why we call the Cool Worlds Lab. Uh, there's uh, four graduate students here in my team with a few undergrads working with me over the summers and continuing now a little bit into the semester. And uh, we love anything to do with exoplanets. And of course, we also like to tell you guys on YouTube about our work uh, over on our outreach channel uh, called Cool World Slab. Yeah. But uh, most specifically, and this is kind of coming up in the chat, is you would like to find an exomoon. That's right. Yeah. So the thing I'm most well known for uh, in my career has been the whole exomoon side of things. I did my whole PhD thesis on that topic pretty much. Um, and it was it, at the time it was pretty new and radical and people re weren't really talking about exomoons. Um, it was almost kind of a little bit of a, a joke that there was someone even looking for exomoons at the time. <laughs> but that was okay. I knew, I knew it would come and it would come around over the years. And uh, we, we still, of course, do that, especially my graduate student, Alex Tichy and me, we, we both uh, work very hard on that exomoon problem. We have an exomoon candidate that we announced last year that was published in Science. I've got sort of the cover, you can't see it, but it's up here on my wall. Uh, when we got published in Science, it's always a big deal for a scientist. And uh, we're continuing to monitor that star, actually. We can talk about that later on, but yep. we continue to make some observations of that. And of course, we do lots of other uh, cool stuff to do with space and astronomy and exoplanets as well, apart from exomoons. But that is my baby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's start with that then. So let's start with like, what will it take and what do we know and what do we think we know about the state of exomoons out there? I mean, we're now at what, 4,000 plus exoplanets, mm. but one possible exomoon and then maybe one smashed up moon orbiting tabby star and maybe something else that's like uh uh spewing uh lava like uh yeah. right like io but but you know where are we at in the hunt for exomoons and, and what's it going to take yeah i think it's a good comparison is thinking about where exoplanets were maybe 20 even 25 years ago um back then there was a handful of exoplanets that had been claimed in the literature and some of them turned out to be bogus and some of them actually turned out to be real. Um, but at the time it was deeply unclear to the scientists working on it, what they were really seeing. Um, for instance, Dave Latham, who was one of my mentors when I was over at Harvard, uh, was one of the discoverers of the first exoplanet. Um, but he, when he announced it, it was this is in 1989. Um, when he announced it, he was cautious and he said, you know what, it could be a brown dwarf, it could be a planet, I'm not sure. Uh, and in hindsight, we actually look back at that as probably one of the very first detections of an exoplanet. And I think we're kind of in that 
regime now. We're finding signals that we can't explain. We think they're consistent with exomoons, but it's very difficult to give a slam dunk detection because we just don't have any statistics, right? Uh, when you find the first hot Jupiter, it blew everybody's socks off. Nobody believed it. Mm -hmm. They thought, how could you have a Jupiter-like planet so close to a star it doesn't make any sense with what we know about the solar system and of course over time we've now learned that hey those are actually a lot of those things out there we now know of hundreds of hot jupiters and so maybe once we find hundreds of exomoons which are all maybe there's a bunch of neptune size exomoons that was the size of our candidate this neptune size exomoon maybe it won't be so surprising then in hindsight but right now you stick your neck out and you say hey i think we've got a neptune size exomoon then not surprisingly, there's going to be skepticism and pushback and yep. people are going to be like, hold on, hold on. Like, yeah. how, how do you make that? Are you sure about that? So, um, yeah, that's part of science. That's how science works. It's iterative and um, it requires people to push things forward and get pushed back. And it kind of works in that sway motion. Two steps forward, one steps back, maybe is kind of how mm -hmm. science goes. And uh, that's, that's actually what makes it exciting is that we really don't know the answers. And uh, to me, I'd, I'd rather be working on a subject where we have no idea what the answer right. is rather than the case of let's just collect even more and more and more statistics. This is, this is it. This is the frontier. And I like working in that area. Now we talk about the techniques for finding exoplanets themselves using say the mm. transit method, using the radio velocity method and using micro lensing. How do you have to adapt your techniques to be able to find or hope to find exomoons? Well, there's a, a whole host of techniques that have been proposed for looking for exomoons. So, you know, we can talk about one or two of them. And each of those methods you just mentioned has a means of also looking for moons, I would say. Probably the only method which can't look for exomoons is radial velocities, actually. Um, radial velocities watches the wobble of a star. And if you take Jupiter and imagine it wobbling its star and then add on an, uh, an Earth-like moon around Jupiter, then the wobble of the star is basically identical to just making that Jupiter-like planet slightly more massive. The residuals between a moon planet versus a planet are like at the micrometers per second. Right. And that's just fantastical compared to what we can do. You know, even in like a hundred years, frankly, what we can do with radio velocities is just no one's even dreaming of that. Um, so that, that method's out, but microlensing, you can look for moons that way if there's a if there's a moon along with a planet. The, the system passes in front of a distant star, gravitationally bends light around it, and we can see both of those objects should bend light. And indeed, there was a candidate object found through microlensing a few years ago. Uh, in the end, that object the authors felt was probably slightly more likely to be a planet around uh, a star rather than a free-floating planet and a moon. That was kind of the, they were tied up on those two cases. Um, there's been one, as you mentioned, of this volcanic, uh, system that's like spectroscopy so you're looking at the light you're looking at the different colors and you're seeing things which shouldn't be there you see this huge sodium absorption in this case which uh, they argue hey planets shouldn't be doing that that looks like there's a huge uh, sphere of gas around that thing um, consistent with what a moon planet interaction might look like and then even in the radio you can look for these things you can have um i you know uh, sort of a uh, synchrotron emission and cyclotron emission uh, interactions between the magnetosphere of the moons and the planets. All those methods can work. The method we use is different. We just look for transits. I think that's almost the simplest way. It's been obviously the most successful for looking for planets. We have 5,000 planets found that way. And we're looking in the same means to look for moons. And I like that method because we know it works for finding small things. And it gives you a few pieces of information. You can measure the mass of the moon, the radius of the moon, and then eventually you can go back and see it again and again, and uh, maybe even get the atmosphere of those things. So that's the method I like. And I think the benefit, right, is that you've got all these planets that are Jupiter mass or many Jupiter mass that are orbiting within the habitable zone of its star, and you throw those out. And you're like, you know, I mean, maybe it's interesting to exoplanet researchers but for those of us who are hoping to find some kind of evidence of of life out there that's you know obviously that's not going to work but then for you it's like well hold on a second you know what about their moons so what yeah. do you think about the habitability of light of you know of these moons around other planets obviously you know endor from from star wars is the classic example right yeah no, I, I, those films do great press coverage for me, like especially Avatar. <laughs> yeah. Avatar got everybody thinking about exomoons. It was great. 
Um, so if, yeah, I was always thinking like, it'd be great if we could find an XM and time it with Avatar 2 or something. Get James Cameron on the phone, see if he's interested. But um, we, yeah, with, the, uh, with these habitable zone planets, you're right that it seems like there are more actually gaseous planets in the habitable zones of their stars and there are rocky planets. And in part, that's because the boundary between what we call a rocky and a gaseous planet has actually been sort of shifting down over time, not in reality, but just as our understanding has improved. We used to think it was kind of like two Earth radius, and now it seems like it's more like one and a half Earth radius. And the things above that are probably all just mini Neptunes and, and gas giant planets. And there's a lot of those at the right distance, potentially, that if they had moons, rocky moons, they could have liquid water and therefore life. Um, are there any reasons why a moon might not be capable of having life? Um, not really. So, you know, if you look at, scientists have been looking at this for a while, so there's several papers studying the habitability of exomoons, and there are no showstoppers as far as we can tell. There's no real reason why a moon couldn't do this. In fact, some cases they even have advantages. Yeah, I was so, wondering about that. Yeah, if you take a, an M dwarf, you, uh, a red M dwarf is these, you know, the smallest stars in the universe, the most common type. Uh, Proxima Centauri, our nearest star is an M dwarf. And of course, we know that Proxima Centauri has a planet now in the habitable zone of its star. But people are concerned about the habitability of that planet because it always has one side of the planet facing the star all the time, just like our moon is tightly locked to the Earth. And these, these planets, they're so close to the star, that will happen to them. And so that's got people worried about the climate and uh, atmospheric collapse and things like this. Um, the moon gets around all of those problems, though, because if you have a moon that's tightly locked to the planet, even if that planet is itself then tightly locked to the star, that's OK, because the moon will get equal amounts of illumination on both sides. Right. There's no such thing as the dark side of a moon. You can't have it. Actually, both sides of the moon will always get equal amounts of illumination, irrespective of tidal locking, whatever. Like, they'll always get mm -hmm. that. So in that sense, they, they have some real advantages over their planets. And I've heard as well that one thought is that having those tidal interactions provides, you know, keeps the core active, keeps the volcanism happening, mm -hmm. brings fresh nutrients up from the surface, helps keep a magnetosphere going potentially. So there might be some advantages to having a place that's orbiting a gas giant as opposed to yeah, up around the star. Absolutely. And you can even extend that and say, hey, what about if that gas giant gets kicked out of the solar system altogether and it's just a rogue world floating between the stars? If it retains its moons, uh, those moons could actually still, as you say, have tidal heating, just like Enceladus does to a certain degree and Europa does even more so. And therefore, that could provide the source of energy needed for life. So I think there's a, there's actually a neat paper about that a few years ago. And they called it some, I think they called it a Steppenwolf world. Uh, so it's these... <laughs> Rogue planets where life sustains on the moons. I have no idea why they called it that. Maybe That's a great idea. Listeners yeah. Know, but uh, yeah, so they, they have a lot of opportunities. So I'd uh, like to shift gears a little bit. So you've been doing a lot of great work here on YouTube and, you know, you've been posting a lot of the kinds of the cool videos that, you know, the cool world videos that, <laughs> um, that I think a lot of, of, of my audience, audience is really fascinated in, you know, why are we alone in the universe? Those kinds of, of ideas. But you've mm -hmm. also kind of taken things to the next level, sort of drawn from the uh, Avi Loeb um, sort of bag of tricks to come up with and answer really cool questions and ideas. I mean, you did a paper on the halo drive using um, uh, slingshots around a black hole to yeah. go high velocity. Uh, and you, of course, talked about this, this idea of the telescope, uh, turning the entire atmosphere of the planet into a, a telescope. That's pretty out there. Um, <laughs> you know, like, like, do you find like being, we're doing this work on YouTube, having this chance to interact directly with the public, being both a researcher and an educator, but at the same time being kind of a public persona allows you to entertain some of these ideas that are less practical, but a lot more fascinating? Yeah, that's a good question. There's an interesting synergy going on, an interaction between all of these activities, that's for sure. Um, I think I keep saying this to my colleagues that, you know, for a long time, outreach in astronomy departments and at tier one universities like here at Columbia has not been the sort of thing which has been traditionally uh, valued to that higher level. It's kind of like fourth or fifth 
down on the yeah. list of what's necessary to get a good job. First is your research, second maybe is your teaching, and then third is maybe sitting on committees, and then fourth might be what you're doing on outreach. And uh, I really don't see it that way, obviously, as you can tell from the amount of uh, work I do. And I think I think it is beneficial to that number one priority to at least these type of universities, to your research, and even to my teaching as well. Um, so as you say, like working on these outreach videos has often actually helped me to generate great ideas. Um, it's given me license to think and dare to dream and uh, ponder questions that are normally things which exoplanet astronomers do not think about. Yes. Um, you know, I, it, a lot of this actually started for me by going to a breakthrough Starshot meeting. Yep. And that that kind of got some balls rolling for me. I did a little video about it. Um, it got a great response. And uh, that sort of encouraged me, hey, maybe I should, you know, people really seem to like this kind of stuff. And I certainly enjoy it intellectually. And so I played around a bit more with it. And I have to say, when I'm working on those papers, it's thrilling to mm -hmm. work on them. And I I'm can't wait to, to get into the office and start cracking on those, on those research topics. Um, and I still love looking for exomoons, don't get me wrong, but I've been doing that for 10 years, yeah. even more than 10 years. So it's, it's not as fresh and exciting to me as I guess what you might bracket those last two projects as like this astro engineering which has kind of almost been the, the direction I'm getting more interested in. Mm -hmm. And techno signatures, the search for um, life beyond a uh, solar system through technology, looking for the products of technology has been something I've been interested in a long time. But again, I felt encouraged and emboldened perhaps through the work I've been doing on YouTube. Um, but at the same time, these things are also becoming uh, more respected in their own right, regardless. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly the interactions I've had and all my all my subscribers who've, you know, and interactions I've had on in the comments, not all of them, but the vast majority of yeah. them have been great. And it's really like, give me, you know, it's because of those guys that I'm really doing this. And I feel like um, I can uh, keep pouring my energy into making those types of uh, papers and making those types of videos. Yeah, it's an interesting, like... I don't know. It's it, like, I think for like a lot of people who get into the field of astronomy and, and aerospace and, and these kinds of things, like their, their love of science fiction, their fascination with the universe, a lot of the stuff brings them in, in the first place. And then the, just the hard reality of just how difficult science is, how hard it is to work out any additional information about the universe sets in. And then you sort of have to slot yourself into mm. just the established way that we do things around here. Mm. We're a, this kind of a university or that kind of university. And then at, at the, and so like you have like like in through my experience, you know, like I will I will push people to just, you know, to talk about some of these more fascinating concepts because I know that's what the, my audience wants to hear. It's not necessarily what the scientists want to talk about, but it's what the public wants to hear. So I think it's very rare to to essentially cut out the middleman, right? I'm the middleman. And you're in a position now as both a researcher and a person who's involved in outreach to be able to just outreach directly and to not necessarily require the the need of the media to be able to help you get your message out there. And I think that's really powerful. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of people doing that at all, even attempting it in the least, not to mention doing it as well as I think what you and and a couple of other people are are doing. And so, you know, from my perspective, I absolutely see the future of what outreach looks like, you know, this time when I am no longer necessary to help translate your papers to a to a wider audience, and I have mad respect for it. But do you think, I mean, do you see in Columbia and other universities and other people that you talk to, you must have these conversations with other astronomers, and, and they're kind of going like, is this fun? Are you glad you're doing this? Is it you know, how's this working out for you? Do you, do you find that there's more of an interest now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think those papers on the more, you know, you know, Bolden side, uh, Avi Loeb side, as you might say. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lovian, yeah. Yeah, Lovian, they're, they're playing. Yeah. And you're right that when we get into science as children, uh, it's, it's through play that you kind of, uh, actually, we do a program here at Columbia where we teach math to kids up in Harlem. 
and we use math games to teach them because it's it's through games that you actually sort of start to uh, start that passion and um we kind of forget that right you do your college degree you do your phd you specialize you specialize and you're right at the, at the end you're left as this product who's just basically a specialist in this one extremely niche thing and that basically defines a phd is to be uh the master of this one very tiny topic and you forget what it means to take risks and, and to, to play so when i write these papers uh, i have a lot of fun that's rekindling that that joy of doing it and uh, you have to expect there's going to be pushback though yeah and i've had it you know don't get me wrong i've had it, largely i'd say it's positive but i mean i can just think of one just last weekend i had a well-known colleague in my field who threw a lot of shade at me for one of my recent more out there papers and you know if you're going to try and take a risk that's going to happen I, I don't know I, I don't regret it it's just it's part of you have to expect it's part of the parcel but to me maybe these ideas are have a one percent chance of working out but for me that's enough you know if there's a one percent chance yeah. of something you're doing to make a huge difference to the world uh, to me, that's enough reason to want to keep going with it. And it can't be every paper. Every paper you write can't be that unless yeah. you're at the verb. But, um, <laughs> but even it's I, not even his case, right? Like like he'll yeah. he'll he'll do the simulations for what the event horizon telescope is going to see so that they can fine tune their observations. The most critical piece of astrophysics mm -hmm. detective work that's going to be required. Absolutely legitimate. And then write a paper about the habitable period of the entire universe when the background yeah. temperature of the entire universe was the same temperature for liquid water. And could there be life there? I don't know. And then, you know, like as long as you keep showing up and do your main astrophysics work, and then if you get a chance to play, I think that's. Yeah. That's it's great. And he's, push, he's pushing the conversation into places where no one else is taking it. Yeah. And uh, how can you how can you throw out ideas until they've been investigated? Somebody has to actually put it forward, check yes. it out, see if it if it makes sense or not. And yeah, I uh, he actually gave me a great piece of advice when I was at Harvard. He gave this talk to a lot of us and he said it's like stocks and bonds that you it's like investments. You want to put most of your money, maybe uh, when you're older, maybe, or you, you can't afford to take much risks, you're in that position, you might put most of your money in bonds. But you don't want to forget about your stocks because your stocks are where you can make serious returns, right? But there's kind of a low chance of it, of it coming back that way. And uh, he presented that way that he likes to have a balanced portfolio of spending 40% of his time on the high risk stuff and then 40% of his time on the safer stuff. And uh, that fills him up intellectually, but also keeps this, uh, this steady um, process of writing more conventional papers mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. And then when you go back to those conventional papers, I think you'll find that you come back to it with more excitement and more energy than you did anyway, right? If you're just doing that solid, solid, solid day in, day out, you burn out. Like it happens on YouTube as well, right? People burn out all the time from just making videos all the time. And uh, I, I certainly can understand where that's coming from. So I think having that balance and uh, throwing outreach in there as a third axis yes. as well keeps everything fresh and exciting for me personally. So yeah. I love doing all that. And, and I think like I love to look through, say, Astro PH, like look through the pre-press research that people are, are working on and just find really interesting stories. And I and like once you do this work long enough and you see the way the news cycle goes that mm. someone wrote a paper, I'm sure, you know, someone at the university said, are you working on any something interesting? And someone says, I, I've got this thing and they've only got so much resources and the, and the, the press agent doesn't have necessarily the technical knowledge to be able to cover the discovery. And so just nobody ever hears about it. And then you've got the flip side where, you've got a big university with more resources in the field who, who can, mm. who can drive more eyeballs to the work. And then lots of people will hear about it. And I think the, the, for a lot of, you know, if I had advice for the astrophysicists and the scientists and the people coming up who feel like their, their work is interesting and it's going to make an impact, they can do this direct outreach. They can do what you've done as a perfect example. And, mm. you know, and be able to go directly out to the public and be able to share and communicate what they're working on, but in a way that still holds true to the, 
to the, you know, making sure that yeah. the research is valid and all that kind of stuff. And it feels like, like, I hope more people are starting to get that. And I see some interesting uh, press releases coming out of people that are adjacent to you, like some people proposed from Columbia about a, a, a lunar elevator concept, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah. I see, I see some, yeah. some reverberations happening. Uh, for, but that was actually one of my, one yeah. of my students was the second author on that. So yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I tell my students that uh, spend, we do the Google 20% thing. We say 20% of your time, I encourage you to just work on summer out there. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it turns into a paper, just by doing it, it will fill you up and you will have so much fun with it. You'll learn yeah. new skills, you'll yeah. learn about this other field you didn't know about. And yeah, that space line's a great example yeah. of that. So, uh, yeah, going to a tight reach has become more common as well. And I know some colleagues now are writing in Scientific American, they're running blogs like Abby has one, Caleb Schaff has one. Um, I know just uh, today, I think they published something by Laura Kreiberg talking about what is a habitable planet and all the controversy we've had in the last couple of weeks about K218b. So scientists are getting the opportunity to speak directly. I think that's great. I do think we still need you though, Fraser. Yeah. I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't wanna do this my whole life and my whole career because I, you know, when I'm doing outreach, as much as I love doing outreach, it, in a way it's, it's not doing my first love, which is research and I love first and foremost, just come up with ideas and work on those ideas and working them through. Yeah. And then once it's like being in love when you're working on those things and then you want to tell somebody about it. Yeah. And that's where the outreach comes in. So uh, to me, yeah, to me, I, I couldn't imagine doing just one thing solely. And you guys have to cover so much ground. I mean, you go all the way from cosmology to uh, stars to planets. I, I don't know how you do that. I mean, that must take so much research. I know preparing my videos takes a lot of research. Most of the time I'm talking about things I've worked on, so I, I should be the guy yeah. who knows it inside out. And even then I'm still like checking everything really carefully in my scripts. Um, so I can't imagine how difficult it must be to work on just everything in astronomy or space in general. That must, I mean, that's daunting to me. So I'm glad we have people like you who are so great at translating that. And I often turn to you when I want to hear about discovery. <laughs> What's the, what the hell is going on yeah. in this cosmic discovery? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's funny, the the most useful thing that I've done is these live streams, especially like doing stuff that's live QAs, where I have to, in the moment, be able to speak intelligently, I hope, about every topic that can that can possibly come my way and speak with accuracy, <laughs> and try to be entertaining. And, and nothing has sharpened my brain for this process than all the time I've spent doing live streams. So if there's one piece of advice I would definitely provide to really anybody who wants to spend mm -hmm. more time doing this, just the more time you can spend being with this, with this little delay between when things are thrown at you to when you have to deal with them, the better. Um, and I'm sure being in the comments, answering comments and questions and, and take, you know, people give you ideas and make you think about them and you take it to the next level and doing stuff live is also really important. Um, so the audience is definitely getting a little uh, agitated. They would love to uh, have okay, some questions answered. So uh, yeah, so so by all means, uh, I'm kind of assuming it's funny. Like I got a lot of people saying, you know, can you do a video on the telescope? And I'm like, why? <laughs> Why bother? Like, what could I possibly say that has not already been said by the person who came up with the mm. idea and then created a video about it? Same thing with the Halo Drive. So, um, so let's. If there's burning questions, I can. I'm happy to take. Yeah, them absolutely. Um, all right. So Zapfan Zapfan asks: Any chance of getting a CubeSat to test the telescope? Relatively inexpensive. So has anybody taken your idea and run with it yet? Yeah, that's a good idea. So yeah, well, I was thinking about this just recently. I was in Israel for a conference with a bunch of engineers and scientists from different fields. And we talked about this quite a bit. Um, one of the challenges with, I mean, a CubeSat by itself is cheap. So that sounds great. You can build them, you know, the smallest CubeSats are almost like 10,000, 20,000 bucks, put them together. Um, this would need a bit more sophisticated um, machinery inside it than that. Um, and then you have to launch the thing. Now that's where it gets complicated because the launch costs for a low earth orbit, LEO, are pretty cheap mm -hmm. because we're going up there all the time, you know, to refuel the ISS or put satellites up, so that's cheap. If you wanna to go to where I need to go to put the telescope, no one flies there. I mean, I'm going past the moon um, and there's very few missions which are regularly going out there. So you're talking about like the James Webb telescope will eventually go that kind of distance, Ariel will go that yep. far. Gaia went that far. So you have like half a dozen 
telescope super straight there, but it's far less regular. And they're really not um, used to putting CubeSats and flying out that far. So you're kind of asking, and you know, is James Webb going to be willing for me to say, hey, can you just uh, hold here and just let me come out and we'll do a little maneuver? And yeah. they're like, yeah, this is a $10 billion mission. I don't yeah. know if they're going to be game well, for that. Ari I don't know if you know, Ariel is probably going to have a Comet Interceptor mission fly with it. So they are actually sneaking. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. so they are sneaking some smaller missions on board Ariel when it flies in 2028. Yeah. So there could be an opportunity to to test out some of this technology there. That'd be great. Um, so that's that's definitely an opportunity I'm interested in. Um, the other complication with this though is you do need a shade um, to block out the Earth, and that shade has to be quite large. Um, has to be probably of order of sort of 40 meters um, for a CubeSat. So. Uh, I mean, a shade is cheap. It's just aluminum foil, basically. But yeah. you have to unfold it, and you have to do it precisely. Um, so it's far cheaper, of course, than a 40-meter telescope. But that's still a bit of precise engineering that you need um, in the fuselage to come out and unfold correctly. Far easier, as I suggested in, in my more recent video, would be to use a Juno and test it with Jupiter um, using Jupiter's an antenna rather than as a, as a telescope, use it as a a giant antenna and I have actually received I put it on my channel we did hear back from the Juno team after that video went up uh, one of the uh, someone in the flight uh, flight coordination office the flight navigation office uh, contacted me um, and a few of them took, took a look at it and liked the idea I think but uh, they they commented that there's basically no opportunity for Juno's orbit to give the correct alignment now actually they're kind of passing through it right now Oh no. Um, but it's too late. It's too late to sort of send the command and change what they're doing. So it won't go back to that position unless they force it there. And they're just not willing to do that because it's, you know, again, it's a billion dollar, multi billion dollar mission. And they don't want to risk uh, right. losing their science goals on the way. So I can totally understand that. I mean, I'm not going to. Uh, but even, you know, that. If, if it isn't going to work with, say, Juno, maybe it'll work with the Europa Clipper, which is going to do a similar really mm -hmm. long orbit out way out from Jupiter and then and then come back. I mean, the point is you put the bug in people's ears and now yeah. they're they're as they look at their missions, maybe there's a chance to briefly use Jupiter as an antenna just to see if there's any there there before going back to yeah. the science that they're planning to do. And I think you'll also see the t the, the the case with the uh, LSST. You'll probably see some stars being lensed like this in a similar way, just because it's looking at so much of the sky all the time. Um, this has actually already been seen, for instance, for Neptune. Neptune has been caught in 1987, passing over a distant star. And you get this, what's called a central flash, where the, the, the star disappears and then it comes back and looks bright and it's like, it's like a, a rim around Neptune. So that's the effect. It's been observed. It's just, it, they weren't planning on using it there as a telescope system. Um, so they didn't block out Neptune, for instance, which is what you'd really want to do. So I think LSST will get many instances like, of like that, where we can at least see if the amplification levels are similar to that, which is predicted. Um, but uh, I'm not I'm not an engineer, so I'm not planning on launching a CubeSat yeah. myself. But I, I am hoping to get people excited enough to want to try. Well, I think the point is that you get the idea out there and it and it allows people who are interested in this idea to potentially consider it. And you have no idea what the ramifications of, of you know, for you, it was a month of, of sitting and doing math and, and putting together mm -hmm. a video. And then you put the idea out there and then it just ferments for however long it's going to take for somebody to finally think of doing it. I mean, we're, we're still talking about bussard ramjets and O'Neill cylinders, mm -hmm. right? Which was, which was yeah. the seventies, the yeah, the seventies, yeah. right? So people sat down and yeah. did some math and that's, and, and, and we are still all obsessing about them in, you know, in the, in the space exploration nerd community. And I think it's just because, um, these ideas that tickle the imagination, people want to consider them, right? And the, who wouldn't love a more powerful telescope? And it's just that it's, it's a clever idea, right? Um, Mark Gazer asks, do you have any more uses for planets besides using them as telescopes and antennas? <laughs> uh, hmm. Uh, no, I mean, I, am, I have to say, I am working on another space engineering project right now um, that, I'm, that I am very excited about. Uh, I don't really want to give away too many spoilers about it, though, because I don't know if it's going to work out, and I don't want to give false promise to you guys. Um, 
but it doesn't involve planets, but it does, it is something in the solar system that we could build. So that's maybe all I could, uh, all I can really say about that. Uh, planets, of course, are used often for gravitational slingshots in the solar system all the time. Um, and of course, you could even, you, you, we actually do use them for braking as well. You can aero break off the atmospheres um, too. Um, and of course, one of my uh, interests that's being sparked ever more is thinking about climate change. Um, thinking, I'm an astronomer, so what on earth does an astronomer have to say or do about climate change? But I just kind of feel like all of us at this point, things are getting so desperate and so critical. I feel like I'm compelled to spend some fraction of my time thinking of some crazy solutions for this. I just, I, maybe no, amount to nothing, but I just feel like uh, it, it's almost a, a shame if all of if all of us, seven billion of us, spend some time thinking about this and and working towards solutions, uh, it it could lead to a dramatic change. And it's kind of uh, on the and there's so many brilliant people in my field who really um, think it's like someone else's problem, mm -hmm. some someone else genius. Maybe Elon Musk will say solve this, you know. And uh, look, the cavalry isn't coming. Like that's not that doesn't. We've been waiting for that for like 10, 20 years. No one's coming to save us. If we're going to save us, we have to save ourselves. Um, and that's that's uh, kind of how it was a little bit with the telescope. I was like, if nobody else is going to do this, I'll have to do this damn thing. And uh, I'm kind of thinking that way a little bit about climate change. I don't know if I have anything to contribute, but I am spending some time now trying to think of what we could do to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at the end of the day it's a planet right it's what you've been studying for a lot of your time it's the laws of physics you've got the mm. black body radiation that's coming from the sun you've got the reflected emissions that are coming from the earth that are opaque to the earth's atmosphere and getting absorbed by the various chemicals like there are all of these physics related things that that's are going right. on and and a lot of it is yeah. related to i mean even um to be able to hunt for some byproduct of 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 this going on somewhere out there in the universe would be useful as well, right? As part of science, not yeah. necessarily to confront it directly, but to help us understand what's going on or even what's going on with Venus. So I think there's there's all kinds of of, of value there. Um, yeah, there was a fun paper by Eric Guidos who said, "Hey, we're thinking of building a sunshade right in space to cool the Earth, a geoengineering solution, and if other civilizations do that." that's a big piece of glass or mirror, or whatever you're going to put up there. That's a big thing that you're putting up in space. We could detect it. And that then became the basis for this film, Clara, which was at the Toronto Film Festival. And I, I showed the trailer on my channel and we talked about it a little bit. So this is, yeah, this is an example of, uh, of, these, of these ideas propagating through the chain all the way eventually into the theaters. Yeah. And then people hearing about these ideas there as well. So, um, yeah, these are, it's, it's difficult to tell where these ideas will come from and, I th and where they'll go. And I think uh, if we all spend a bit of time working on this, uh, we'll have some uh, very creative solutions, I'm sure. Uh, Nick Pocek is asking, um, what uh, upcoming telescope are you most excited for as it relates to your research? I think the James Webb Space Telescope is the big one. That's the precision that thing's going to pull off is going to be game changing. You're talking about a 6.5 meter telescope. I mean, the telescope I mostly use is Kepler. So it's six and a half times larger. So that's going to get us down to um, sort of a few parts per million photometry on some bright stars. And you've got systems like TRAPPIST-1 where you've got you know three planets in the habitable zone. One of them looks like it's consistent with a rocky core, with a, well, sorry, an, a, an iron core with a rocky exterior. And it's right at the right place, potentially for liquid water. And James Webb will be able to smell the atmosphere of that planet. I mean, that is extremely exciting to see what's going to come out of that. And of course, for exomoons too, you're going to go from Kepler's capabilities of finding about Mars-sized moons is kind of its lower limit of what it can do in the best case. And you'll be going to moons smaller than our own moon considerably. I mean, all of the moons... The, you know, the Galilean moons of Jupiter will be detectable, Triton, the moon, things like all of those things will be no problem for James Webb. So that's that's it, just the pure capabilities are very exciting. What I'm not as excited about with James Webb is just how competitive it's going to be to yes. get telescope time. Um, so, but that's that's the nature of it. You're going to have to have a very compelling proposal. So yeah. can, that's right, I think, for such an expensive uh, resource. Um, 
So uh, in terms of the science that's going to come out of it, though, it's going to blow us all out of the water. I can't, I can't wait to see what's going to be found. By yeah, and it will absolutely launch. There's going to be no problems. It's going to launch. It's going to be safe. It's going to go. It's going to extend, and everything is going to be fine. I'm not even worried about it. No, that. I know. Me that's, neither. Yeah. What, yeah. No, it's going to be just super duper. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I mean that's one. I mean you must have looked at the the specs of say Louvoir and the Origin oh, yeah. Space Telescope and Habex. Are either are any of those more sort of specialized for the kind of work that you will want to do? Yeah, I mean those missions, uh, especially like Louvoir, is getting into this game of direct imaging a bit more. And uh, direct imaging is, I always say this to my students, it's kind of the end point of exoplanet astronomy. It's where, I mean, we're messing around with transits and radio velocities, but taking a photo of another Earth-like planet is, is when you see that moment, it's going to be kind of, and that's on the cover of uh, you know, New York Times or whatever, that's going to be an amazing moment to see that image. Uh, a little pale blue dot, you know, yeah. and tens of light years away, let's say. So that's, a, that's an extremely exciting mission. Um, I don't work on direct imaging too much right now, but I have to say when, when you see what, it's capable of doing and what they're talking about doing. It does get me interested in doing some direct imaging work. Um, of course, it's, it has lots of challenges doing a mission like this. Um, uh, actually, curiously, an exomoon is kind of a pain in the butt for, for these, uh, these missions. That's because one of the things they're really trying to do is detect the signatures of life, biosignatures. And what is a biosignature? Well, most broadly, it's just a chemical disequilibrium. It's like stuff in the atmosphere that shouldn't be there. It should react. It should, yep. you know, oxygen will oxidize. If, if, if three million years, all the oxygen would go if life disappeared on the Earth. So we're looking for these signatures. But if, the, if you have a planet and a moon, and they're just sort of blended together in one pixel, and you can't resolve them, which is most likely what it would look like, you could have the chemistry of the moon and the chemistry of the, of, the, of the planet, and you can't tell the difference. And so it looks like there's a disequilibrium that's not real. So moons could actually be um, a false positive, for right. bio, bizarrely, of life. I mean, it it's, could just be the moon. It's similar to this controversy that's happened with this uh, Kepler uh, K218b, the one where they found the evidence of water vapor in the atmosphere of the, of the mm. planet, right? But it's, it's important to understand that just because you've seen water, you don't know how much water, where it is. Is it in the atmosphere? Is it on the surface? Is it in a tail, a tidal tail that's stretching out behind it? Um, mm. You're just seeing that this, the fingerprint that it, that it exists and not necessarily mm. exactly how it's, how it's laid out. I mean, when I image Jupiter, I have to either turn down the, um, the brightness to the gain to get either the, the, you know, the, the features on the planet or to be able to see the moons. I have to, I have mm. to shift back and shift forth. And so will it be the same thing? Will you need a coronagraph for your planet so that you can see your moons? I don't think anybody's talking about doing that. So it's, it, it might be possible to do that. Um, one of the ways you might try is looking at the, the way the light changes over time. Um, as the moon orbits around, you might see phase changes, just as we see the phases of the moon. Uh, so you, you might be able to tell there's a moon that way. You could also maybe see as the moon is to the left-hand side, let's say the, the center of light will slightly shift over to one side. And when it's on the right, it will go the other way. Um, so you might see the centroid of light shift back and forth as it as it goes on its orbit, and that could tell you there's a moon. Or you could maybe even do it spectroscop spectroscopically by actually detecting that the lines are Doppler shifting in opposite ways um, as they as they go around each other. So there's a few tricks astronomers have thought of, but we've never had data good enough like this. So it's, we, these are all just kind of ideas at this point. No, nobody really knows if any of these will really work at this point, but it's going to be fun once we get that kind of data that we can start worrying about those sorts of problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I really like this idea. I mean, right now uh, we can only see 1%, less than 1%, depending of the planets, and they have to be perfectly lined up from our perspective or mostly aligned. Mm. I believe you answered a QA question uh, uh, in one of our older videos about this. And, and the direct imaging just throws that completely out. You now just look at any star system you want, 
block the light from the star and you get to then see whatever it's got going on around it. Yeah, it's very powerful. I mean, the, the downside is it probably won't work for M dwarfs, which are the most common yeah. type of star. But sun-like stars, they're, they're very difficult to do with any other method anyway. So, and that's where we, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why you might think a sun-like star is the best place to look for life anyway, since we live around one. Um, and thus, uh, there's, it's kind of the only game in town, really, for trying to detect life on a on a Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. So that's where it's the end game, you know. It's the it's the future of the field. And uh, once we do that, what's the next step? I don't know. Maybe we'll start throwing craft out and actually trying to visit those things, because uh, there's only so much you can do from sensing from. 10, 30 light years across the universe. Like you actually at some point probably need to visit that. Right. And that's, that's where the work on the breakthrough star shot. And that's when you fire up the halo drive and, yeah, uh, and sure. quickly go from, from star to star. Um, one additional, I guess, issue is with like here in the solar system, right? We've got Mercury, we've got Venus, we've got earth. Earth is what we're going to want to be looking for. But there are other planets, and with, say, the transit method, how do you find a Neptune that's in a farther orbit? You know, you have to look, you see one transit, and then you come back 100 years later, 150 years later, yeah. and you see another transit, and then, you know, third one, just to confirm, you know, you're up to 500 years now. It's hard. Um, if you're lucky, you see one transit. So let's say you look for... Uh, 10 years, you know, no missions actually look for that long, but let's say you looked for 10 years and your planet is on an orbit of a hundred years, then there's, an, and it has the right alignment to transit, by the way, which is also another big if, um, with all those things being true, you have about a 10% chance, right? So it's a hundred years, it's orbital period in a 10 year window. So a 10% chance it will transit in your window, but you're right. You're not going to see it repeat. And there's been a lot of work lately and I've been involved in this a little bit, but, um, uh, right now there's a huge push amongst my colleagues to try and solve this problem because of TESS, which really has a, has a big problem with this, of what do you do with a single transit? I mean, traditionally, yeah. Kepler's just thrown them out. They've been like, I don't know what to do with that. Like, I, I need three transits before it's a planet. And now we're realizing with TESS, which only looks at each field for 27 days, that that's throwing out like half of the planets. Like, that's not, that's not sustainable. We want to use those for science. And so there is information about the period of those planets. If you look carefully at the shape of that transit, the slower the planet is moving, the longer the transit duration. So you can effectively measure the speed of the planet from the duration of the transit. This requires very precise mm. to pull this off. Um, you have to think very carefully about eccentricity because the velocity of a planet also depends on if it's eccentric, it's going to, its velocity is changing. Uh, throughout the orbit. So there's a lot of complications with this. Um, but in principle, it is possible to get some kind of weak constraint to at least tell the difference as whether you're looking at a planet beyond the snow line or a planet more like that of the Earth. You could at least make that kind of dissemination. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't even think about that idea that you time how long it takes for the dip of light and that tells you the velocity and that tells you potentially. Um, I mean, I think that there are so many amateur astronomers and just other people out there willing to do these follow on observations. Have you looked into like, are there enough people able, willing and able to do confirmations to assist with the candidates that are being turned up? Is there enough follow on observations for for tests for Kepler for for any of this? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's been uh, not necessarily for confirmation, but I'd say for identification of candidates, uh, there's been this huge citizen science project um, called uh, Planet Hunters run by the Galaxy Zoo team. Um, and that's been very effective. I mean, they found uh, a few dozen planets using Kepler, which were then confirmed, uh, many of them as well. Um, so they're called like PH1B, Planet Hunters 1B, Planet Hunters 2B. Um, and then even just recently, I think TESS just had their first one. So the first Planet Hunters planet, I think it was TOI 800 and something. Um, and that was found by people just looking through the data. And actually they are really focusing on those long period planets, especially um, because those are very challenging for algorithms to detect because a single blip, I mean, it's very, if you don't see it repeat, the algorithms typically just think, well, that just could be random noise. I mean, 
I, I, why should I believe that's a real signal? Whereas a human being will see that same signal and see that it's got the right shape. They'll notice, oh, the curvature at the bottom's right, it's symmetric. Um, and even though it's noisy, I can still kind of make out that it has about the right depth that I would expect it to have for a planet. So a human being could just kind of do all those extra checks that are difficult to codify in an automated way. And so the, these amateur uh, astronomers and citizen scientists especially are making still a very large impact. And I think that a big part of the future of this is going to be using them for machine learning, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So... But I sort of imagine the situation where, say, Tess makes an observation on a star, sees sees a dip in its 27 days that it's watching this star, and yeah. then it's not going to come back to this region of the sky for another three years. And the chances of that, or whatever it is, two years, and the chances of that lining up to whatever is the orbit, like like only one in 12 planets are going to recur in that same time frame. So you've got these single yeah. observations that if you had someone go, well, I'll volunteer to watch star HP six numbers for the next year, nonstop every yeah. night with my telescope, does that exist? Cause that would be um, really useful, right? Cause then yeah, you would get I, those second I, and third I, observations, I, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody has a official program that's that's doing that to be honest with you but that's that sounds like a completely reasonable thing to try um with the test planets one thing to bear in mind is that even though these are bright stars uh they're, they tend to be small planets and that's because all the big planets around the big stars have been found mm -hmm. uh, around the bright stars sorry have been found already um, i mean we've been astronomers have been monitoring the sky for 10 15 years looking for transits already. it's not like TESS is the first mission to do this mm -hmm. What TESS is doing a little bit different is that it's in space, so it doesn't have to compete with the atmosphere, and thus it's able to find smaller planets than that which have been found before, because it's space-based photometry. So, um, yeah, that's why that's why I'm not exactly sure on the answer, because it, uh, maybe I think there will be cases where amateurs could detect the transits from the ground, but it might not be as simple as one might naively think, because this right. is space based telescope yeah but i mean you can already like you can look up the transit times you can build a special telescope rig that will let you with a photometer and will let you confirm exoplanets that have already been confirmed because you know when to yes. look and you know what you're looking yeah. for right and so you you yeah. you can you know there's, there's, that's there's, right it's definitely been done it's yeah there's tutorials on youtube but it's it's interesting to me like that there are all of these planets that are potentially being found but there just aren't enough. My my worry is that there aren't enough just other telescopes willing to just spend all of their time because you don't know when it's going to come back. Right. Yeah. If you see it once, you don't know. It could may take you. It may take 150 years and it may be back in in 28 days. And yeah. you're not going to know unless you there's constant observations going as opposed to tests, which is <clears throat> going to just turn up these these quicker ones. So that's just my that's just my thought. So but this that's right. I think I think you're totally right. I think amateurs could make a difference. Yeah. Um, but I would probably pick the big single transits rather than the small single transits to go after because that that will maximize your chances for being able to recover those signals from the ground. Yeah. Um, John Holleran is asking, how big of a telescope is needed to observe a transit? Could we use CubeSats to point in one direction continually? Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. In fact, um, people have even tried to do this. Um, Sarah Seeger's uh, group at MIT in particular have been, I know, been pushing on this. There was an effort to do this with Beta Pic B as well. Beta Pic B is a known directly imaged planet that was predicted to go under transit and the French, I believe, launched a CubeSat to try and observe its transit. So the downside of these CubeSats is they really, in that case of Beta Pic B, it was perfect because they're tailor-made basically for one star. They just mm -hmm. only really look at one star, the narrow field uh, cameras, and um, you're not able to monitor as large a field as, say, TESS is doing simultaneously. But that's fine because you could have a fleet of them and monitor maybe your 100 favorite stars and just monitor them all the time. And uh, there's a lot of us uh, who are interested in doing something like that, um, especially as the field is maturing to the past, where, the point where we're past just raw discovery of the first transit of this signal, the first planet. And maybe we're more interested now in monitoring the long-term dynamical behavior of these planets. And that's exactly why you might wanna have a CubeSat sat there all the time, 
seeing if there's anything else in the system and also just looking for wobbles of those planets. Yeah, I know there was a proposal um, to try and find planets around Alpha Centauri. And I know we had like a false mm -hmm. positive and now I think people have thrown out that data right now. But they, if you had one telescope and all it did was watch Alpha Centauri for years and years, you would probably be able to get an answer to the question, like a, you know, an astronomical telescope, something in the meter class, and all it did was watch Alpha Centauri every night, all night for years on end, you might be able yeah. to get some, you know, a of smear. course, the downside of a CubeSat is they generally don't observe for years on end, they generally have orbits that decay faster than that. Yeah. So um, they're, they're rarely pushed to a high enough altitude that they could sustain observations for that long. But there's no reason why you couldn't. It's just that uh, my understanding is they don't usually put them that far up above the Earth. I have one one last question, um, and this came from uh, Canal do Diego. Could James Webb be used to try the telescope? Yeah, that's a that's a cool idea. I see where you're going with that because it has a you know it has a chronograph, so you could potentially yeah. do something like that. Um, actually, the we you know I haven't thought too much about using James Webb just because it's it's going to be so such busy. a competitive telescope to yeah. get time on. If I say to them, look, I want you to burn a few hours of your precious telescope time, and I don't think they're gonna they're, they're gonna buy it. We are more interested in the idea of using uh, SOHO's kind of a cool telescope. It actually sits in between the sun and the earth, and it observes the sun, and it sits at the Lagrange point between the earth and the sun. And that means that the, uh, the angular size of the sun is about the same as the angular size of the earth, and it has a chronograph to block out the sun. So it, it could be possible to rotate that thing over 180 and block out the earth. And that's perfect. You've got your line of sight to the stars then and do the observations. So uh, I think that would be the better existing facility or planned facility to try and use. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, whether, whether the team which who have completely different <laughs> objectives and goals are going to be game for this yeah. is anyone's guess. Yeah. I mean, you got to use some of its, some of its precious fuel uh, to do your, you know, your wacky experiments. So yeah, it's, you know, it's worth a try. But again, like I said, you've got the idea out there. Uh, so uh, Dave, we're reaching the end of our hour, I want to let you get back to your regular life. Uh, so so if people want to follow what you're doing, if they haven't already, where can they uh, they where can they see what you're up to? Yeah, so obviously, if you're on YouTube, then the easiest place to find me is on youtube.com slash cool worlds, uh, actually cool worlds lab. Sorry, but the name of our the name of our channel is cool world. So Google that and you'll find us no problem. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. I tweet about things which happen in my group and uh, papers we're working on and other science stuff. That's David underscore Kipping. Um, I think that's it. And then otherwise, just you're, if, you're, if you are into science and you're reading the archive, you probably see my name on there every so often, publishing papers. I always like to promote those. So. Publish your parish. Um, Exactly. That's yeah. the world we live in. Yeah. Well, uh, David, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, very exciting. Uh, we really enjoy the work that you're doing both professionally and also just the the outreach and making this stuff accessible on the uh, on the YouTubes and and websites and all that. And I think, you know, uh, as as a person who, you know, you know, when I look at my competition, uh, I you know, if you're if that's what event eventually makes me redundant. <laughs> it's got my it's got my vote so uh, that's again. not my goal i know that's i know i know goal, but you know, thank you so much for being honest pleasure all right great yeah. thanks a lot we'll see you later thank you see you later guys bye <laughs>